Question, question number 12, Louise Upson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Treaty of Waitangi Negotiations and asks, what recent progress has been made towards the settlement of historical Treaty of Waitangi settlements? Mr Speaker. Honourable Chris uh, Excellent progress. Last Friday, I initialled two deeds of settlement with negotiators of claimant groups. The first was with Mongoharu Tangi Tuhapu. The second was with Naituhoi. The neg negotiators will now seek ratification of those deeds of settlement by their people, and if they are ratified, they will be signed, and then legislation to give effect to them will be introduced in the next few months. Supplementary question, question Louise Upston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What does this recent progress mean for this government's record on treaty settlements? Mr Honourable Chris Finlayson. Well, we're getting the job done. Since the beginning of 2009, there have been 216 milestones achieved by this government, including 33 deeds of settlement, over, over twice as many as the 15 deeds signed in the nine years before that, and more than half the total since the treaty settlement work began in the mid-1990s. And I do acknowledge the assistance here, here comes the bipartisanship. With the assistance of this House, and I acknowledge it, uh, deeds have been given effect to by legislation far more quickly than had previously been the case, and indeed 12 bills were passed last year. What did you say? Point of order, Honourable Trevor uh, Mr Speaker, the, the, the first of two, um, and the, this one relates to uh, a ruling that you've made with regard to uh, a breach of privilege. Uh, on the 14th of March, Phil Twyford uh, raised a matter with you uh, to which you replied uh, on the 20th. And I want to make clear, Mr Speaker, I'm not attempting in any way to have you reverse your decision, and I think it was largely consistent uh, with rulings that speakers have given. However, there is, there is within your ruling, within your letter, a, a ruling which I think would be unfortunate uh, if it stood, and that's where you say only where a member can be assumed to have personal knowledge rather than knowledge by way of his or her official capacity and makes the statement in a situation of some formality can a presumption of intention to mislead arise. Uh, Mr Speaker, the point that I would uh, like to make to you quite forcefully is that if a minister has an official report and has read it, and says that he has read it, if he then uh, deliberately misuses figures from that report in a primary answer, it is my view that that would be a breach of privilege. It, I mean, clearly, that, clearly it is a high test, but to suggest that someone can only breach privilege when the information they have is personal and if they have official information they can't breach privilege uh, appears to me to be wrong, sir. And I'd ask you to consider that and to uh, rule on it at some stage if you so wish. I, I thank the member. The, the um, advice I've received that this is a long-standing practice and it is being based on House of Commons practice, but the member raises a point that is serious. I accept that and I'm happy to have another look at the tone of that letter and I will come back directly to the member. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, I, I, I want to emphasise it's the word only is the one which I don't think has appeared the members made uh, his point. In, in our House the members said, no, Mr yeah. Speaker, the second um, point of order relates to a written parliamentary uh, answer from the Honourable Peter Dunn uh, received last Friday uh, where the question goes to whether he or his predecessor uh, indicated a relationship, a lack of confidence or a relationship breakdown with staff uh, and, and the reports that he has received. Uh, Mr Speaker, the text of the answer is that that's an operational matter and the responsibility of the Commissioner of Inland Revenue. Now, I repeat, and it's actually quite parallel to question 11, the question goes to the indication of a minister to a chief executive of a problem uh, and the awareness of the minister uh, of, of a response. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Speaker's ruling uh, 1554, I think, uh, goes to the question, and McGee 
uh, also makes it very clear that ministers are responsible to the House for their official actions and for the general conduct of their department and officials. And for a minister to reply to a question which says this is just an operational matter, I'm sure you'd rule it out, and you have ruled it out uh, in the House, sir, but I would like you to, to look at that and to indicate whether or not uh, your standard for uh, ministers addressing questions is going to apply to written questions as well as those in the House. Well, and I thank the member again. I want to have a look at the question and I want to have a look at the answer before commenting further and I will come back directly to the member. Honourable members, I have received a letter from the Honourable Leanne Dalzell seeking to debate Understanding Order 386, a privacy breach by the Earthquake Commission. The breach is a particular case of recent occurrence involving ministerial...